Hello, I'm Dr. Mike Cadden, professor of English at Missouri Western State University. And I'm here today to talk to you about a story that I'm certain that you're all familiar with in one form or another, the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Now, the version we know today is a story for young children and features a little girl and a wolf. The girl is rescued by a huntsman or a woodsman or a woodcutter, the, the terms vary. And it's a cautionary tale about listening to your mother, not talking to strangers, and it's an obedience tale with a happy ending. Do as you're told and all will be well. And if you don't do what you're told, somebody may come and save your bacon. So that's what we know today, but it's traveled a pretty long evolutionary road. And by that, I mean, we've adapted it to our current views about children, about danger, um, how and whether we use stories as cautionary tales for children. Uh, if it is cautionary, do we include warnings about danger? to the character in the story, which is a little different than just communicating to the reader or to the viewer? Do we introduce frightening encounters or seemingly safe, innocent encounters as seen by characters and readers? Uh, do we show violence um, in some form in the grandmother's home? How, to whom do people survive the encounter? Um, and what does it mean either way? So there are a lot of a lot of questions have come up in these adaptations. So there's a lot to play with with Red Riding Hood stories. But I want to kind of concentrate on just a few things in recent picture books. Um, for instance, uh, whether there's a, a warning by the mother to little Red Riding Hood about the danger. Um, so if there is one, is that an obedience claim in the story? Um, how does the wolf deal with the grandmother in Red Riding Hood? Uh, are the women eaten? Are they not? Are they scared off? And then there's the woodcutter's interaction with the wolf. Does the woodcutter kill the wolf? Does the woodcutter scare off the wolf? Is there a woodcutter at all? So I want to start off with what I'm going to call uh, the just-in-time versions. And I'm calling it that because uh, these are the most recent and in many ways most sensibly told stories of rescue that involve a woodcutter. Um, and in both, the woodcutter comes just in time. So here we have Little Red Riding Hood. And in the beginning, we have Little Red Riding Hood being told by her mother to not talk to strangers on the way. So we see that here at the bottom, that command of obedience, right? And um, here we have uh, the wolf is attacking Little Red Riding Hood, and the woodcutter here is the woodcutter. And the woodcutter dispatches the wolf. So the wolf is killed, um, not chased off. Uh, and we've had a command of obedience. Another recent version kind of mixes that up a little bit, this Little Red Riding Hood. And in this one, uh, we don't have any kind of warning to read about behavior on the way. It just says, I have a very special job for you, she told Little Red Riding Hood. Grandma's feeling sick. Will you take her this fresh fruit? Of course, cried Little Red Riding Hood. And she kisses her mother goodbye, and that's all there is to it. No warnings of danger, just a regular trip. When the wolf gets to the grandmother's house, he's pounding on the door. Grandma finds out about the next day. Well, nobody's eaten there. And then grandma comes back with some help. The woodcutter and the woodcutter chases the wolf out the window. So in this one, we have no warning of obedience, and we have a wolf that's scared off. And usually in folk tales, we like to do away with our villains because what happens when you chase off the villain? There's a sequel, right? The wolf comes back, and and that's a little too messy for most folk tales. Um, in one form or another, stories with woodcutters are versions based on the Brothers Grimm Little Red Cap from 1812. And that's from the Children's Household Tales. It's an adaptation of their original folk collection. So let's think about how the Brothers Grimm introduced the woodcutter. It's a little different than the just in time versions. The wolf had scarcely finished speaking when he jumped from the bed with a single leap and ate up poor Little Red Cap. As soon as the wolf had satisfied his desires, he climbed back into bed, fell asleep, and began to snore very loudly. 
a huntsman was just passing by. He thought, the old woman is snoring so loudly, you'd better see if something's wrong with her. He stepped into the parlor, and when he approached the bed, he saw the wolf lying there. So here I find you, you old sinner, he said. I have been hunting for you for a long time. He was about to aim the rifle when it occurred to him the wolf might have eaten the grandmother and that she still might be rescued. So instead of shooting, he took a pair of scissors and began to cut open the wolf's belly. After a few cuts, he saw the red cap shining through, and after a few more cuts, the girl jumped out crying, oh, I was so frightened. It was so dark inside the wolf's body. And then the grandmother came out as well, alive, but hardly able to breathe. Then little red cap fetched some large stones she filled the wolf's body with them, and when he woke up and tried to run away, the stones were so heavy that he immediately fell down dead. The three of them were happy. The huntsman skinned the wolf and went home with the pelt. The grandmother ate the cake and drank the wine that Little Red Cap had brought, and Little Red Cap thought, as long as I live, I will never leave the path and run off into the woods by myself if mother tells me not to. Well, that's some pretty gruesome stuff, isn't it? Uh, and it even includes a little torture for good measure. Uh, all of that feels oddly unnecessary, right? The just-in-time versions do away with all of the eating, the pulling out of the wolf, the filling the rock with bellies business. Um, it's also worth noting that Little Red Cap misses the point at the end of the story about what has happened. It wasn't leaving the path that got her into trouble. It was trusting a stranger who turned out to be a predator and compromising herself and her grandma. So let's take a look at the beginning of the Grimm's version. Um, we're talking about warnings and no warnings. One day her mother said to her, come little red cap, here is a piece of cake and a bottle of wine. Take them to your grandmother. She is sick and weak and they will do her well. Mind your manners and give her my greetings. Behave yourself on the way and do not leave the path. Or you might fall down and break the glass and then there will be nothing for your grandmother. And when you enter the parlor, don't forget to say good morning and don't peer into all the corners first. I'll do everything just right, said Little Red Cap, shaking her mother's hand. So this is about manners and obedience. It's not about warning about danger, stranger danger, encountering some kind of a, um, personal danger along the way to grandmother's house. It's presumed to be pretty safe. So I want to shift back to the endings of the grim inspired version there are different stages of showing the women saved from the wolf, from no sign of all to cutting open the wolf, to pulling the women out of the wolf. How far do we go in showing what's really a metaphor of saving, but absurd and maybe disturbing visually? So Grimm's no warnings. This is not about um, stories with warnings. So the, these are what I call the off-camera versions, right? Uh, we don't see the wolf cut open and the women pulled from the belly. So in Marshall's Little Red Riding Hood, um, we have, we do have a warning, like modern versions, not like the grim version. Don't tarry, don't speak to strangers. Yes, mama, said Little Red Riding Hood. And at the end, near the end, the wolf has eaten the grandma on Little Red, it off and here comes the woodcutter. And we jump visually to the scene of the women out, the woodcutter holding the grandmother, which looks odd if you don't know that she's just been pulled from the wolf. We see the wolf here, but just sort of hinted at. It's really off camera. Another modern one um, has a warning in the beginning. Remember, my dear, don't stop to talk to anyone and come home before it gets dark. There are dangerous creatures in the forest. But I'm going to send you out there anyway, because that's the kind of mother I am, apparently. It, it is strange when you think about the warning versions about the mother who would be willing to send her daughter out into, the, into that danger. But that's supposed to serve an obedience narrative, right? We're not supposed to question that. Here we have the woodcutter in a strangely leprechaun hat. Um, seeing the wolf fat belly in bed. And in this one, we cut right to him leaving with the skin and grandma and little red riding hood safe. So all that is left to the words. 
the pictures don't play a role in that. And that's pretty important in picture books. I skipped over that. Um, we also have no warning. And um, well, I'm going to cut right to, to the woodcutter part. Here at the end of Trisha Sharkheimi's version of Little Red Riding Hood, we have the woodcutter who shows up in the story. This is really word for word the Grimm version. But we also have him approach the body with the gun, thinking to himself, we better cut them out. And then again, visually, we jump right to the be having been saved, not the actual saving. So the, in these off-camera versions, it isn't visually clear what's happening. If you were just looking in the pictures, you would have no idea what was going on. Um, I uh, also wanted to show you this one, Little Red Riding Hood. And um, in this one, we have our woodcutter hearing the wolf snoring. Here he is looking from the wolf's back. He surveys the situation. And in this one, we get a hint of what's going on. It looks like he's, she's being pulled up, and we get that tail there. But it's still left a little bit to our imagination, right? Now, there are picture books that show something closer to the action being depicted, if not the actual action. Um, in Levert's, Marielle Levert's Little Red Riding Hood, we have um, pretty much, again, the grim version retold with cartoonish, well, actually folk art pictures, which is always inter interesting. She sent off just like in the grim version with her basket uh, and when we have the huntsman hearing the noise, and sees Little Red Riding Hood, we don't cut right to Grandmother and Little Red Riding Hood standing next to the woodcutter, although they are. We also see the wolf lying on the bed with his belly slit open. And this is pretty graphic. It does. It, it's still after the fact, but at least it's showing a little bit of cause and effect, right? How much of this do we want to share with kids? Um, if it's a cautionary tale, or if it's a story of excitement, how much do you show? In a, in a book called Little Red Cap, which even um, is a nod toward the grim title, usually uh, it's Perot's title, Little Red Riding Hood, but the grim text. Um, we have the woodcutter show up, here he is getting ready with his scissors. This one doesn't just show the after effect. Um, and it shows you just how absurd this action really is. Uh, really, it's a metaphor. So when we make it literal in a picture, it looks very absurd. Here it looks like um, the woodcutter is pulling them out of what would look like clowns coming out of a clown car, right? Like there's a hole cut through the bed and they're coming up through it. It's visually absurd which takes a little bit of the um, fear factor out of it. I, we almost want to laugh at a picture like that. And then afterwards, they're enjoying, they're enjoying uh, their meal. So this one, at least, is kind of combining the words in the pictures to show you um, a little bit of what's going on in a very surreal looking Little Red Riding Hood that, again, is basically following the Grimm version. We get another visual of what it would look like by the way, though, this wolf is pretty creepy. When it gets close to some of the male wolves, you'll be creepy. This one will give you nightmares. But um, when the woodcutter sees the wolf sat with grandmother in Little Red Riding Hood, you get a picture of their happy reunion. But not before there's, again, kind of an absurd image of them coming out of the wolf. So there are picture book versions that show the action or the near action, depiction of the wolf cut open and what is essentially a retold Grimm story. And the question there becomes, um, if somebody's previewing these Red Riding Hood books for their children and they're flipping through, what's their response going to be to being shown that action? Um, they all do describe the action. However, 
Well, let's go back to a previous version, one before Grimm's, um, and one that it almost feels like the Grimm's have stacked this woodcutter after the fact story, right? Comes after they've been eaten. Um, and this is the 1697 Charles Perrault Little Red Riding Hood. And this one, like the Grimm's, does not include a warning for the girl. She's meant to be ignorant of the danger. That's important. There is no warning at the beginning of Perrault. At the beginning of Perrault's, it says, go, my dear, and see how your grandmother is doing, for I hear she's been very ill. Take her a cake and this little pot of butter. Little Red Riding Hood set out immediately to go to her grandmother, who lived in another village. So again, no odd warning about there are monsters afoot, but go ahead anyway, uh, just to test obedience. This is about being ignorant of danger. And the outcome is very different than, per, than the Grimm version. In Perot, it goes, grandmother, what big teeth you've got. All the better to eat you up with. And saying these words, the wicked wolf fell upon Little Red Riding Hood and ate her all up. And that's it. The end. She's eaten. But there is something tagged onto the end of it, uh, making this into a fable, something that's uh, an animal tale told with acknowledged moral purpose. Moral. Children, especially attractive, well-bred young ladies, should never talk to strangers. Or if they should do so, they may well provide dinner for a wolf. And this is an important follow-up. I say wolf, but there are various kinds of wolves. There are also those who are charming, quiet, polite, unassuming, complacent, and sweet, who pursue young women at home and in the streets or in the woods. And unfortunately, it is these gentle wolves who are the most dangerous ones of all. So um, here, what the story is about is laid out. The metaphor is laid bare, right? The wolf skin is coming off. We see a man, right? That this is about um, this is about sexual predators. The warning isn't for the girl in the story. She sacrificed for the reader. The reader is supposed to be shocked at this terrible outcome of a girl who's ignorant of danger and confides in a dangerous stranger. So uh, the warning comes at the end not in the beginning, because at the end, it's for the, the listeners, the beginning of their new story, right? They're meant to be horrified at the prospect of being eaten by the wolf, right? So the Grimm's and Little Red Cap um, have, the Grimm's have Little Red Cap thinking that leaving the path is the point, right? The Grimm's version continues here with the woodcutter. Perrault's ends badly, but includes the moral to warn the reader about something the little girl in the story was ignorant about. Now, a kind of compromise I've, I've seen in one version is a, a Roberto uh, Innocenti version where it's set in the city. And um, what's important about this one is we have, we have some jackals, so, so to speak, some lesser, lesser wolves who show up. And then this big, strong, um, what seem to be the woodcutter, shows up and interrupts uh, her being accosted. He gives her a ride part of the way to grandmother's house, but drops her off beforehand. And we see him racing above the street above her, and he's trying to get to grandmother's house first. So you know, the reader knows what's afoot here. And we see him entering the trailer and her close behind, and then she's about to enter the trailer and make her face. There's no woodcutter here. The mother is sad, waiting for Red Riding Hood to come back to the apartment. And we see a man who now looks like a wolf, wolf head, right off. But then we have this intervention where the storyteller says, no, no, there's another way to end this story. And we have the woodcutter in the form of the police show up and take him away. So this is uh, trying to give us both of them, trying to give us first the shocking warning, and then we have, but wait, there's another way that this could go to leave us hopeful. So over time, we've gone from a metaphoric tale with a bad end for a girl ignorant of predators, with a moral spelling, and that's about men really, to a story about an ignorant girl who saved from her ignorance, who misses the point altogether, Grimm's, to modern stories about a girl not ignorant of danger, who ignores the warning, dodges the story with a bite, and learns a lesson. 
But as a cautionary tale, these modern stories are much less shocking, and it's not spelled out that we aren't talking about wolves, but predators of another kind. So there's an even earlier version we can point to to kind of see how Perot himself has even kind of softened this story from the horror story that it could be. Um, there's a story recounted by Paul Delarue, a French folklorist who published the story of grandmother, a story that was orally told in the 14th century. And in this story, the girl who's on her way to a grandmother's house, no warning about danger from the mother because she doesn't know about the danger, a bazao or werewolf accosts her on the way and asks her where her grandmother lives. Then the monster goes and eats grandmother when the girl arrives, the monster has the girl eat of the grandmother's flesh and blood, disguised as meat and wine that the wolf has put in the pantry, and then has this girl strip out of her clothes, throw them into the fire, because she won't be needing them anymore, and get into bed. When Red Riding Hood, or the girl, who's not called Red Riding Hood, uh, figures this all out, she begs to be able to relieve herself outside. And when she does so, she runs away. So she's a trickster. This is a trickster story. We, we don't really see other trickster versions in these modern stories. Um, and while she is saved, she saves herself, she's defiled by this cannibalistic taboo that um, if not by the lecherous wolf, he has still caused her, even unknowingly, to um, compromise herself, that she's sullied now. And um, you'll be defiled one way or the other if you're not careful. So, um, and this makes much more clear the obvious sexual relevance to it, and it makes clear why we have beds and, and red rotting stories and all the rest. So this all provides us a way to think about uh, what kind of insights we can come up with regarding what the narrative project is for a red riding hood story. Is it to protect children from danger? Is it merely to titillate them with an exciting near miss adventure with a wolf. Um, it can be both of those things, but the story has changed its purpose by and large. We, we've gone from sexual predators falling upon ignorant girls who were defiled to, to the Grimms, which is a weird compromise where the wolves actually do fall upon disobedient girls who are then saved, but they're sometimes first eaten, right? Uh, to modern stories that just stops the action before it gets too far. Wolves who threaten disobedient girls who are saved before they can be assaulted and learn their lesson. The lesson though isn't always clear. It's more about obedience than paying attention to would-be predators. So if we think about Grimm's onward, past Perot, past uh, the folktale about the werewolf, um, we have the romantic view of childhood from Grimm's time afterward. Um, and that's a view that tells us that we have to protect the innocence of children at all costs rather than to share with them dangers um, and compromise their innocence for their safety. So this persists until today, uh, seen in these Red Riding Hood stories, um, the protection of the reader of the danger, the knowledge of the danger, not of the danger itself, right? So do we tell children stories, even through metaphor, of the dangers of being victimized in real life or do we protect them from the subject of being victimized through not explaining the metaphor? So, uh, and we hear this anytime somebody says children shouldn't have to worry about such and such homelessness or whatever it might be. Um, protection from stranger danger or protection from the subject of stranger danger. So um, last we're in a time where any version of Red Riding Hood um, is fair game, right? And so we have, for instance, versions in which um, it's just important to have Red Riding Hood and uh, the grandmother in the story. Um, a girl with a red cape is all we need. Um, and this Lisa Campbell Ernst version, a very recent version, um, the girl's on her way. She's told and warned not to talk to strangers. Um, when she meets the stranger, he's kind of a goofy looking wolf who is. Um, um, dressed up in, in human clothing, and he looks pretty uh, intimidating, but what he's really after are the muffins in the basket. And once he finds out who made the muffins or and where they're gonna end up, she, he goes to try to find grandmother, 
and on the way he accosts this farmer in the field. Turns out the farmer is really grandma who throttles the wolf and, and threatens him. And um, we get a close up of that threat right here. So it's the grandmother who's really the dangerous one. And what happens is they invite the wolf in for muffins and lemonade. And what they end up doing, the wolf doesn't escape. The wolf isn't killed. Certainly doesn't have rocks sewn into his belly. Um, he is put to work in Grandma's bakery. And he is meant to work off his uh, his debt to society, so to speak. He's going to be rehabilitated, given a trade. Um, he's forgiven, right? This is a very different kind of notion of the monster that we would see in um, other Red Riding Hood stories. Certainly not the predatory werewolf, right? So he's a petty thief who gets caught, roughed up by the grandmother, and rehabilitated. None of these versions are right or wrong. They're not about accuracy. Um, really, uh, if they're to be preferred over each other, that's that's really your call. Um, but what they show us is the development of our relationship to cautionary tales, especially about sexual predators, uh, stranger danger uh, in a post-romantic age. Do we want to save the children in one way or the other? So I look forward to your comments and questions. Uh, it's a it's a pretty interesting development of a story, uh, and uh, I appreciate you listening to me today.